All right, so first of all, I was going to say thanks to all the recursion knots, but I promised Chris I wouldn't embarrass him too much because I actually know him quite a long time. But we can all do that in private. Um, but it's an absolute pleasure for me to be here, and it's, it fills me with pride and memories. And, and for some of you who know, I've spent 25 years of my professional and personal life in, in Utah, so it's, it's great to be here. But I would ask all of you and all of the investors to ask, I, I, I would like to remind people that this is in Utah, and it's in Utah for a reason, and I wanted to step back through that reason. But before I do that, I should just remind everyone that Chris, I think you were doing MD-PhD at University of Texas, San Antonio, right? So he came here in 2009, and uh, you know, what he's done is, is incredible. Uh, he uh, came here to complete his MD-PhD, which he never completed, <laughs> which as one of the people who run the MD-PhD program, there's winner, 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 didn't complete. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but with that, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, go back to, Understanding, and I think it's really important that all of us understand what recursion is in relationship to what Utah is and actually what brought me to Utah. Um, and how when I met Chris, it was like a rebirth of, of, of the same idea, but with speed, with rigor that I didn't think was possible. And so I want to do that by by sort of explaining the way that sort of Marty explained his own personal journey. So I'm going to take you back a few decades. So I, uh, I did my MD, PhD, which I completed um, at WashU in St. Louis. I did my internship, residency, and fellowship there. And I need to point out someone here that some of you recursion people don't know and some of your investors. Joe Militage, can you raise your hand? So Joe Militage is a major consultant for recursion, but I'll just tell you how, how lives are linked so much. When I was an MD-PhD program, and some of you will have to ask at some point, how do I know Chris? Well, really the way I know Joe Militage is not through Joe Militage, it's actually through his wife, because his wife used one tissue culture hood and I would use the other one, but Joe Militich was, uh, was a professor, he had MD, PhD uh, at WashU, and he was coming back. He was coming back from San Francisco and starting his lab. And the reason I want to just highlight him is he was head of discovery at Amgen, head of discovery at Merck, and he's the one who essentially trained me. Uh, so if things go, for those of you who are investors, if things go sideways at Merck because they have a new president of MRL, it isn't my fault. It's Joe's fault. Um, but I just wanted to sort of emphasize that I remember getting ready to leave WashU, and, and Joe Militich will understand this. So WashU is in St. Louis, and it's a great medical school, but they have a little chip on the, sh the shoulder. Um, and when you go into where the, where the uh, lecture halls is, there's pictures of every Nobel Prize winner and you will get pimped as to what each Nobel Prize winner did. That, that's, that's the culture of that. So I was sitting there going, I'm gonna leave WashU and I'm going to go to Utah. And Joe will understand that, but, but there are different medical centers and different things. Duke is a yes sir, no sir institution. Harvard's not. Stanford is definitely not. But WashU's a little bit of a yes sir, no sir. And so getting called in by the chairman of medicine, David Kipnis, or the chief of cardiology like Bert Sobo, because their concept of if you leave WashU, you have to go to Boston and San Francisco. In fact, Joe went to San Francisco. And I said, I wanted to go to Utah. And they're like, now that I speak Utah, U Utah dialect, it's an oh my heck moment for them. <laughs> but it's not, that's not the lingo they use in St. Louis. 
But the rationale I did do this is because there was a cycle going on. There was a cycle going, going on in relationship to science that you could see happening. And I, I'm going to tell you what I saw there, and then I'm going to bring it back to recursion. You had big data back then. You had a phenomics database. It was curated, collated, and it was connected. And it was only in Utah. It was only in Utah. That was the Utah population database. That was the data. You had algorithms to turn that data into insight. What were those algorithms? There is a very important paper that any of you who trained at the University of Utah best know this paper. Because if you ever did rounds with me, I would ask you what are the most important papers that came uh, in Utah. And there was a paper that was by Botstein, Davis, Skolnick, and White. It gave the rationale as to how you would be able to take phenomics data in a population database that was linked by families and how you would find genes associated with disease. And I would remind everyone, and unfortunately Marty's not here, there's two Stanford people on that paper and they're, oh, okay, where, where is he? All right, there are two Stanford people on that paper and there are two Utah people. Let me remind you, who actually found genes using that? You have Skolnick and you have White using that to get you BRCA, NF1, APC, long QT, pulmonary arterial hypertension. I'm looking at Jeff right there. That's what you had. You had big data with an algorithm giving you insights that could be used as information. But that information is simply information because an association is simply an association. If you do not have the power to do an experiment to prove causation, you don't have anything. When Joe and I on behalf of Merck go and look at companies and you tell me you have all this algorithm and this, we're like, yeah, 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 but prove it, show me. And so as you walk around, what I would tell you is the reason I came is that they had the Utah database, they had the ability to do algorithms to get genes that then triggered a hypothesis, and they had Mario Capecchi doing knockout mice to be able to turn that idea, that information, that hypothesis into causation. And only when you have causation do you have any semblance of knowledge, data, information, and knowledge. And if you do that in a cyclical way, and you can make it a flywheel, just maybe you have a chance at wisdom. So I'm sitting there, and there's a scary office that the chairman of medicine, and the chairman of medicine, Wash U, can, can make your career, but can also do the opposite. Is that a fair, is that a fair thing, Joe? I mean, they, th right? And so you laid that out. That's what I came to Utah for. And that, played out for how many years, right? From essentially the 1990s to even now. So you sit there and you go, what is it? So they had big data, Utah, they had an algorithm, they could change causation and this. And then I have someone who absolutely knows no biology, has less laboratory skills than Marty does, come and want to join my lab in 2009. But he has an engineering background and he thinks very differently. And when you find out his family and how their family thinks about parallel processing and all of this and how they think about technology, you understand, hmm, this guy thinks different than I think. And so again, he comes to my lab and in some sense, it's the same sort of thing. And so it's this, when you think about what recursion is, it's how do you take big data, in this case, phenotypic data, using the advances of computation and imaging. I would remind everyone the roots of computation and imaging. Some of you may know, but the, the founder of Pixar comes from? All right, the founder of Adobe comes from? right and there are buildings in this and so that's what that's the sort of view that we had so essentially what 
what Chris proposed was, instead of doing it human genetics this, can we do it in systems that could rapidly advance? But, but it isn't just big data with AI in this. If you do not actually do a causation experiment, and if you do not turn into a flywheel such that you can rapidly iterate, iterate three things, iterate your data, iterate your algorithm, and iterate how you do your experiments, you're not going to maximize that. So that's what's happening, right? And the concept is, could we increase the speed but not be sloppy? Could we be rigorous but not rigid? And could we make it a flywheel? So when you listen to what has happened, that's why it fills me with enormous pride to come back to Utah to see what all of you have built. And I'm especially, I'm especially thankful for all of you who have given your time and energy to make this possible. And those of you who have invested, those of you who have risked important capital, we thank you very much. And so with that, I wanted to make sure that we understood what is special about recursion, its roots within Utah, but I do want to turn it over to the next speakers because the reason why we're trying to do it is we're trying to affect patients and their lives. Thank you.